It's Wednesday night, and we're live from Oaksdale, Washington, in the Educated Touch Studio. Welcome to FX Outside the Box, with your host, Nathan Nordstrom. Special guests include Ryan Hoymey and you. Here he is, Nathan Nordstrom. Have another wonderful ethics discussion going for us today. We have, um, FYI, we're uh, we're now into spring, and uh, we've been playing this game now for almost three months. We uh, we're actually on number eleven for the code of ethics, and we started figuring out a couple of things. First one is to say hi, to do our little introduction. And hopefully to get all of our personal chatting done beforehand, so then we can actually get onto the subject. Um, so let's uh, let's do a little fun recap here, like we tend to do. First thing I wanted to do is go to the website, so we know where uh, we all know where to go. Well, there's a couple of websites that we'll bring up. First one is uh, YouTube. Uh, this is YouTube Red, but the YouTube account, if you go into um, Educated Touch, you'll be able to hit any one of these ethics videos. You can also hit Massage Nerd and, uh, and get some of Ryan's awesome videos um, from about a billion years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're able to go there. Next one is the Educated Touch website itself. We've got home, we've got instructor, we've got classes about us, blogs, content, and much, much more of so much fun. However, if we go to what we're actually talking about today, the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Workers <sighs> uh, website, you'll be able to come on down and find from ncbtmb.org at the very bottom on the about page, you go to the Code of Ethics. When you see the code of ethics, you can go right on down to the code and start reading them if you are bored or if you need to know it, like you do in most tests in most schools. However, if we go on down, we're gonna actually find out that we're on number 12, correct? Is that where we're at? Yep. Phew, thank you for keeping me on track, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> provide draping and treatment in a way that ensures the safety, comfort, and privacy of the client. All right, there's so much here. I just just wanted to uh, to start with provide draping. What's good draping to you, my friend? Um, with I would say with males in general, um, since I've been in the field 20 years, we just males just have to be a little bit more cautious and we have to communicate more definitely just because we are the minority <laughs> okay I, I i can see that but i can also argue the other direction okay let me hear it okay because yes we need to be we need to have silk sil we need to have safe draping so that we don't get our keister suit Ladies need to have safe draping so that there's no inflection of what actually that therapist is trying to do. If a, a person who came in for a massage and has had tight draping their whole professional experience with massage therapy, and then they get someone who's fluffing the drapes and kind of keeping it loosey goosey, um, that male client, may think there's something else going on. And so to keep from an illusion of inappropriateness or the possibility of inappropriateness, that's where I think everybody needs to have that safe professional draping. Disagree? No, I totally agree. Okay. Yeah. yeah but Go ahead. Yeah. I, I remember back in the day uh, when I first went to massage school 21 years ago, I mean, we would actually hold up the sheet when people turn. People still do that. People yep. still do that. And it drives me insane. We, uh, I, I was doing a training a while ago, and um, we were in a treatment room, and the massage therapist 
did that and I was on the other side of the sheet and they were getting ready to pull it up and I, hold on, hold on, hold on. And I got behind them and I said, there's another way we can do that. And so after they had gotten turned over and that, then I was like, okay, here's what you should do to make sure that there's no question about who's looking and who's not. And the therapist was like, oh, oh, well, I hadn't even thought about that. Thank you. Yep. I think the problem is not what we're thinking about as a professional massage therapist. It's what we're not thinking about as a massage therapist, because the stuff we don't think about sometimes can get us in more trouble than the stuff we do think about. Yeah, and sometimes people, sometimes therapists just get too comfortable. Hi, <laughs> yeah. I got a statistic for that one too. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if you know how much I love statistics. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of play that game. Um, so most massage therapists who get in trouble for inappropriate touch are not on the first visit. Most appointments are after the fourth. What? Yeah. Do you know why? No. Comfort. Comfort. <laughs> yeah, you've gotten comfortable with that person. They're now testing boundaries. They're now testing uh, if they have a, a mind of, uh, of being, a, what do they call it, a predator's mind. Um, they have to make sure that the environment is comfortable. Uh, another thing that I, I've been teaching um, owners of spas and owners of different franchises and places um, is that if you want to make sure that your office, your spa, your clinic is safe, make sure that the massage therapists do not own their room. Move them around. Because if someone does have a likelihood of being uh, an offender of any sort, they're gonna be less comfortable in different rooms because then it's not their space, their territory, their turf. Oh. And that's part of the predator okay. mind concept. And that's scary. That's weird that we have to think that way. But when we look at the possibilities of someone who could get in trouble, hurt, um, and, and really have a, a negative experience towards massage therapy, we wanna make sure that they are safe. And draping A number one is one of the standards that you see go down significantly um, as you see a client as people see clients more often because they start getting familiar with them they're not concerned um, I, story a couple of months ago in my practice not very proud of it but um, had a young lady on my massage table um, we were working on her hips and lower back, had her face up, had the drape, uh, a, what we called a diaper drape back in the days. I think we still call it a diaper uh -huh. drape. <laughs> or Roman and, drape. Yep. <laughs> and her your leg drape, okay. Um, had it tight around her leg, uh, offered for her to hold on to it. She said, no, it's fine. And I, so I pulled it tight and we started doing some stretching of the leg. And her response was, Gosh, I bet you get flashed a lot of hooch. Oh. My response was, nope. Nope, I don't think I have once. Yeah. Like, really? Like, I'm pretty comfortable with my draping. I make sure things are covered up. Yeah. And she just kind of alluded that, gosh, you, I guess you do see a lot of naked body. Well, there's things that massage therapists should not see on purpose or on accident. Now, do accidents happen? Apologize quickly if it does. Make sure it doesn't ever happen again. Those are the two categories that I continue to put out there. So, all right, so safe draping. Um, safe draping does a few things. What is it saving us from? What is the safety, Ryan, what do you think? Uh, from lawsuits. Lawsuits. Reputation. Rep reputation. Reputation. Yeah. What's it protecting the client from? Um, there are boundaries. Um, also cold. I mean, of, of all things. So I remember when I was going through massage school and they'd hold it up like that. It was freezing too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoosh. 
Yep. <laughs> and I'm just going to throw it out. Hey, Chris. Uh, hey, Colette. And hey, Stephanie. It's good to see you guys. Uh, Stephanie Kuhn says hello to you, uh, Ryan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I am following it on the Facebook feed. So if, uh, if anybody has anything that they want to add about draping, feel free to. Uh, we are here and having a lot of fun just being goofy. Um, so let's go back here real quick to a nice um, dated website page um, that is titled Leg Draping. Just real quick, let's see what uh, this massage nerd guy has to say. Oh, that was, that was so late. long ago. I'm sure you have a couple different ways you can actually drape the leg. So what we're going to do is actually bring it over here like this. Bring it over here. Okay, right up to the, the groin region. So some people just have a drape like that if they're not going to incorporate any kind of stretching into the treatment. But if you are going to incorporate any kind of stretching, we're actually going to perform a row and drape, it's called. So we're going to go underneath their knee. So that's the popliteal area. So underneath the knee. They're going to kind of pull it. See, is we're going to pull it underneath here like this. And do not pull it down like this. Don't pull it down like this. Pull it this way out because otherwise it's going to come off their breast tissue area. Then, okay? So just like this. So then you're ready for the leg then. Okay? So, I mean, some people I've actually seen drape just above the knee, but the thing is that's not part of the leg. So you can see how much area you can actually cover for a full body massage then. All right, so. Yeah, eyebrows. Draping another leg. I just kind of wanted to kind of go through that. Now, where did you come up? Uh, you said the rolling technique underneath the leg. Is that, is that what you called it? Roman drape. The Roman drape. I yeah, have never Roman. heard of that. I'd never you heard of called that. It's, it's probably a Minnesota called? thing. Oh, it's a Minnesota, it's Minnesota thing. thing. <laughs> oh, sure, you bitch. Yeah. It's got to be. Yeah. Over there, y'all. Oh, yeah. Sure. Awesome. Oh, man. Yeah, no, so, I, and I think each school has their own bizarre terminology that they start engaging with, and they start just kind of going with. There are some terms in massage therapy that just really reflect straight across that are standard. Um, uh -huh. the one that I really love is undress to your level of comfort. That's, that's like anywhere in the country. If you went into a massage school, they would tell you, okay, you have to tell the client to undress to their level of comfort. And I, I don't know who started that or where, but that one's always fun. And then diaper drape is one that I have almost constantly heard as a consistent. Um, uh -huh. but they all have little twists to their draping mechanism um there's an <laughs> whenever you have dra draping stories you have to talk about the inappropriate draping stories because they're there um when i started teaching in massage school we were at one of the franchise schools uh, here in portland years ago and um when i came in i was already they were already a more advanced class and so i was teaching them more hands-on technique and more of the kinesiology advanced stuff and uh so i told them okay so we're gonna have you get undressed and get onto the tables and um partnered them up and got them ready and half the class grabbed their sheets and went to the bathroom because they didn't have uh they didn't want to use the curtains in the room i don't know why it just wasn't their thing so they all went to the bathroom and they came back with their clothes and wrapped up, talking about Roman style, um, in, in their bathrobe. <laughs> and they dropped their clothes by the door and then they said, flying angel. And they would run across the room, jump and spread the sheet and land on their massage tables. <laughs> First day was a little awkward. Yeah, and, and how we did it, um, when I went through massage school, uh, a lot of times we'd get undressed underneath the sheets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because we didn't have any changing or no lines or nothing, so. Bathroom? What bathroom? Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, and it's the creativity that you start looking at. And 
I, I know that there's been massage schools that have had problems with um, draping and, and having um, someone undress under the sheet um, who is pushing stuff the wrong way and there's a flash. But I haven't, I don't ever remember having any of those while I was in school where people were having problems with that because all the therapist who was holding the sheet was always very conscious of where the sheet was. And I think that's that consciousness that massage therapists need to be aware of to really engage and kind of make sure that their client feels safe. So safe drapes and tight drapes are kind of a very important connection there. Um, so yeah, so I, I really do want to really push for this concept of tight draping because tight drapings, drapes really do give us a lot more understanding of, of what's going on. Uh, so nice to see your face, Nathan, from uh, Renee Fields. Hi, Renee. Good to see you. <laughs> well, good for you to see me. Moving on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So um, th there is this secondary piece that provide draping and treatment in a way that ensures the safety. So treatment, well, what do you think they're talking about there, my friend? So you're, the you're talking about the what? Is that just the massage? No, um, more, I would say more the education aspect. Um, because I myself I always did um, verbal informed consent um, before I started the massage. Because I would, um, especially a new, new client, even if they've had hundreds of massages before, I would explain how, what areas I'd massage, what areas I would have covered all the time to make sure that they felt comfortable with everything then. I always argue that a massage therapist has a new canvas every massage they give. Because yep. even if it's the same client and you see them two days in a row, the second day they're working on a more relaxed body than they were on the first day. And you have, I mean, you always have something new, some new dynamic, some new event that happened in their life, some new changes that are going on and just kind of allowing for new information to happen. Um, and if you're truly assessing the body and actually palpating for change, you'll actually be able to feel those changes and kind of re-engage those things. Now, there's also that consistent thing that happens. Um, you, you see a client, you don't see them for another year, and you don't remember them physically until they lay on your table, and then you put your hands on them, and you go, oh yeah, that's who you are. Yeah, you had uh, <laughs> you had this going on. Yeah. <laughs> it, there is a piece to remembrance of palpable skill. But there's also that secondary thing of just making sure that you're safe. And that in verbal intake interview is, uh, in my mind, huge. Um, I, I'm so irritated when I hear, no, 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 I just got paperwork. I just read the paperwork and, and everything was fine. Um, there's a lot of things that people forget or don't want to write down on a piece of paper that they would be more than willing to talk to Ryan about because Ryan's got a nice big heart and a big smile. Um, and when you're, when you're looking at the different environments that you, you can work in, I mean, you're working in a hospital and I work in a spa, um, you're going to see different conditions than I'm going to see generally, I'm assuming, I hope, yep. I hope I don't have someone <laughs> who needs to be in the hospital. Um, yep. <laughs> so those, those are part of that connection, part of that important piece to say, wait, what is it that we're wanting to really connect with? Um, for my intake interview, there's a couple of really important questions that I use that are standard. One is the, when was your last massage? I, I always want to know that because I want to know either how long has it been or if they've never received a massage before. Ryan, do you have a favorite question? Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the main ones I like asking is, what if you, if, if you've had other massages in the past, what have you liked and not liked about past massages? Absolutely. Because the thing is, I want to kind of delve into their mind and try to mimic um, what they've liked and try not to 
um, do what they did didn't like. So, <laughs> I I I've had I had a client who um, really doesn't like foot massage, and I empathized with him because I don't like my feet rubbed either. I I mean, if they're good, then I'm fine with it. But generally, don't touch my feet. FYI, well, you don't have. I'm what? sorry, but then, then you don't have a soul then, okay? <laughs> you know, if I didn't have a soul on the bottom of my feet, yes, that would be really painful. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Massage my hands, that's great. Yeah. So, yeah, no, and, and so you, you then kind of engage, and yeah, that was one of those first questions of, so what is it that you like and what is it that you don't like? Don't touch my feet. Got it, check. We can put that on the to-do list of, things to avoid and it gave him an opportunity to feel listened to to feel supported to feel connected to actually understand that there is a respect in what we do with what he needs i mean we're a we're a team when it comes to massage the yeah, and the thing massage. is that it makes them feel a little bit more in control too yes there is this new phrase that I want to put out there that's been out there forever. Um, and that is client empowerment. And are we empowering our clients to feel like it is their session and we're there to help them? Because if we're not, we're doing a disservice. Because if our clients truly feel empowered, no one will be sexually assaulted. Mm -hmm. I feel uncomfortable with how you're draping my leg. I'd like it to be tighter. Perfect. I feel like you inappropriately touched me. No, 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 I didn't. Mm, the session's over. We've empowered them so that they can feel comfortable saying, I would, I would be, for, first of all, I would be absolutely mortified if a client stopped the session because they thought I was being inappropriate with them. That would break my heart personally as a professional. But if it did, I would feel more comfortable that they decided to stop the session and felt comfortable telling me that the session is over and I don't want to continue than if they didn't feel comfortable telling me. If they don't feel comfortable telling you, you don't have that power uh, balance so that they can actually relax and feel comfortable in the session. Yeah, and just like I, I love it when they actually tell me if it's actually too much pressure or not enough pressure because so many clients will not say that. I mean, they'll tense up, do whatever kind of thing, but that's why I always try to have a listening hand somewhere else if I'm using a little bit deeper pressure so I can feel if they're tensing up and so I can see if they're not, tell, not telling me what's going on. So, <laughs> have you Were you ever told in massage school or while you were teaching that there was a certain number of times you're supposed to ask about uh, pressure and temperature and um, uh, do they feel comfortable? Is that, did, did you ever get a number while you were in massage school? I think it was like three times or so. Um, but the main thing is when I flip them over, I always ask them about um, temperature, pressure, um, everything else. So it's, it's usually in the, um, early in the beginning and then when I flip them over to do those kind of things. But unless if I see them squirming around a little bit, of course I'm gonna say something. So. I love nonverbal communication. I think it's so important and people just kind of don't get enough of a connection to it. And, and especially new massage therapists, when they're freaking out about, out about what they're doing and seeing if they're actually doing it right and all that. If you can quiet your own mind and get out of your space and actually start listening to the nonverbal or watching for nonverbal communication, you're going to be a, a much better massage therapist. It's, it's those massage therapists who are scared, leery, um, feel awkward, don't know what they're doing. To me, those are going to be the ones who almost always feel like they're going to go into danger, they're going to do something wrong, and then someone accuses them of doing it. And it's, it's sad that that happens, but that's, I think, the only way we can actually help them is by engaging them and saying, hey, hold on, let's take care of you and make sure you're correct and connected with yourself so that then you can get out of yourself and see what's going on around you. Um, and, 
And, and have you noticed um, with draping, um, like East Coast, West Coast, Midwest, um, if people drape a little bit different? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so hold on, I have another video here to show. And a lot of it isn't as much East Coast, West Coast. Um, let me go to, maybe it's this one here. Hi everyone, this is Ryan Hoyme, AK Massager, and today I'm going to explain about draping for the glute region. So for the glute region, um, once you have the leg exposed already, you can just move it over a little bit, and you're just going to bring this here like this, and you can just do a little tuck if you want, but the thing is, just be careful of tucking, so if it's male, you don't want to tuck too much in that area. But again, you can just do a little tuck in that area, and then you can just have the side of the glute. And again, it's Roman draped already, but otherwise, if they don't want to, if you're not going to massage the leg again at all, you can just go like this, and just expose just the side of the glute like this. But again, when it's flat like this, it's more likely to stay. So that's the nice thing about it. So the more flat this area is here, it's going to stay when you're massaging the glute region there. So that's my recommendations for exposing the glute area. Or some people, when they'll go like this, you know, they'll just have the glute and the lower back. I mean, you can even incorporate some of that and even the leg. So you can do longer techniques for that then. So one of the key things that I noticed and it's something that you do in that video, and it is more of a um, a move the drape and let it sit, where more West Coast style is considered tuck the drape and tighten it around, or have the client grab onto it. So I call it tourniquet draping. Uh, it's probably not that intense. Oh. Uh -huh. right. Okay, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, you laughed yeah. and I didn't hear you, so I was scared. Um, so yeah, the tourniquet draping or, or the wrap it around, uh, this is also one of those techniques that I use on sideline. When you're sideline and wrapping around, I think they call it the front fan or the back fan, you would really take one edge and wrap it around the leg and then roll it up and it turns into like a pant leg cuff around their leg so that you can, in sideline, move their leg around. And it's, it's hard to kind of make sure that you're not um, having any questionable um, vision of what's going on. If you can get that tight around the leg and then make sure that the rest is attached to the sheet, people will start feeling comfortable. But you have to make sure that it's comfortable first for you and second for your client. So how do you make sure your draping is comfortable for your client? Communication. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then also nonverbal, like we were talking about before. So the thing is, they could say one thing, but if they're kind of hesitant, you might not want to do that kind of draping. So. Yeah. Um, so there's about a billion excuses that I've heard about why someone doesn't need a drape, um, including, uh, I don't like sheets on me, I'm claustrophobic. Uh, if you're claustrophobic because of sheets, what do you do with clothes? And that, that doesn't work for me. So <clears throat> being conscious and, and being aware of your client's needs and making sure that you're feeling safe and protected are, are two major standards that need to be there to just kind of make sure that you're, um, you're working in a safe and productive way. So just quickly going back to number 12, provide draping and treatment in a way that ensures the safety, comfort, and privacy of the client. Now, I, I've had massage therapists who have said, oh, well, I went down to California and went uh, to this spa where everyone's nude, and, uh, and so sheets aren't needed, and 
uh, and it was great. And my easy response is, good, enjoy it, have fun. However, taking that back to your state may not allow you the same legal standards as it does in that facility because you're not in a massage therapy, massage therapy office that's in a nudist camp. I mean, there's that. There's other aspects that are expected <clears throat> in different settings. Uh, I've also had, um, I, I've had clients who have gone to a massage therapy clinic that was clothing optional. And as she was laying face down, um, she was receiving her massage, and by the time she got turned over, she realized that her massage therapist was naked. And <laughs> she felt odd that in this clothing optional facility, her therapist chose to be clothing optional. It can happen in those settings. But when we're looking at it, we really wanna see that it is for the comfort of the client and for the privacy of the client. So you talked about uh, communication, verbal and nonverbal. I really do like the early verbal communication of draping. So you use the statement, undress to your level of comfort, and then what do, they, what do you say if they say, well, I don't know what that means. What should I be wearing? How do you respond? So I, I, I usually say, um, if you want, you can lay, um, leave your bra and underwear on um, if you feel more comfortable with that. But if you do leave your bra on, is it okay if I unhook the back when I massage your back? So. Awesome. So, <laughs> <laughs> th th this gets into a question that I've had for years, um, and it can, I guess can lead into a debate for us. Um, I'm not comfortable um, tucking into underpants or unhooking bras. And that, that's the standard that I set. And so I've, I've said, when you roll over, if you want to unhook your bra, then we can work on the back. But if you are fine with it, that's, that's fine. I can work around it. And I've worked around bra straps for years. Mm. Um, not very often, because most of the time, when they, when I say, okay, so we're going to be working on your back, they'll usually say, would it be more comfortable if we're going to take off my bra? Sure. And that's before they're even on the massage table. That's that preemptive discussion, that preemptive insight so that you're safe, you're professional, you're productive, and they know what's going on. Um, Anytime you can give someone heads up beforehand is always going to be better than when they're in the middle of, of the fire. Um, Ryan, have you ever been in a uh, stress-induced, freak-out, uh, scary situation? For massage or just anything? Just in general. We'll go general <laughs> first. Yeah, the Boston bombing. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So did you think, do you think you had all your wits about you when that happened? No, it was so foggy. Yeah. And do you remember clearly everything that happened now? Just because I recorded it. Awesome. Okay. So when we look at legal cases where a massage therapist is accused of being inappropriate with a client, the first challenge that is out there is that the person is emotionally distraught already. No matter what happened or what was perceived, they're in a scared, adrenaline-filled moment of, oh my gosh, did this really happen? What's going on? Those are those things. And they don't have a video recording of those moments to really explain to them what actually happened. And as a massage therapist, if a client accuses you of something, you don't have that clairvoyant, clear recognition of exactly what happened. And you also really don't have a really good memory 
if you don't find out about the accusation until a month, two months, six months, a year later. So documentation is very important. If, if it's not charted, it didn't happen. <laughs> yes, and <laughs> no. You don't have too many uh, <laughs> sexual predators charting what they did uh, on the massage table. So I, I was just doing a joke. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I totally agree. And, and I, so I'm, I was an expert witness for a case that finished up just a couple of months ago. And I was so glad because they were bringing me in as an expert for massage therapy chart noting. Um, the case had nothing to do with chart noting, but that's okay. I was the expert for massage therapy chart noting. And so they were asking about what this said and what this meant. And that was one of those pieces where I was saying, ah, so here's what standard documentation means. Now with draping, do we have to write that we draped their leg? Do we have to write that they dra we draped their back to their PSIS? Do we have to write that we um, mobilized their leg or stretched their leg in a way that we stretch everyone's leg or we do effleurage five times down their back in a repetitive, no, we don't. Why not? Because it's what we do <laughs> every single time. If we, if we went and charted everything we did in a one hour session, it would be more than an hour's worth of charting. Nightmare in my mind. <laughs> I hate documentation. I love that it's done and I love doing it. I'm glad that it's done. But I'm, I, I'm dyslexic as the day is long. Anybody doesn't know it, I own up to it. Um, and spelling is not my thing. Clinical shorthand, I can do. <laughs> yeah. It has saved me so much time um, and so many misspellings. Because spleenus services and capitis doesn't usually roll off the tongue or the fingers very well. <laughs> yeah, because uh, work, working in a hospital, too, I mean, we always – kind of have the thought of if it's not charted, it didn't happen kind of thing. So that's why we have to chart virtually everything we do as much as possible, even more than the average therapist too. So Well, and in the hospital, why are you chart noting everything that you did? Because there's, uh, especially with, um, uh, with patients, they have so many different kind of diseases, injuries. Um, there's so many different kind of things that can go on compared to, uh, a regular massage practice. Well, and if something goes wrong um, after the fact, and they're like, okay, so what has changed in the period of time from now and the last time that we saw them, they would need to know that you did stretching, or they would need to know that you changed something or worked on something different, because that could be the difference between, gosh, they're having a side effect now of this medication of neck tension where they didn't last time, well, you worked on their neck this time and you didn't work on their neck the last time. I, yeah. I, I, I know side effects for medications can be crazy. And massage therapy can fight off some of those side effects. Doesn't mean it's getting rid of them, but it's at least changing the biological aspect of what's going on in the human body. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's important to kind of connect with your documentation and keeping yourself safe in that way, but making sure that the client is safe and conscious on your table. Now, what if uh, a client is not safe or feeling safe on your table? How are you going to know with that nonverbal communication? Um, I mean, they're, they're going to be moving around, shuffling around a little bit, but the thing is sometimes that's just anxiety too. So you gotta, that's why a good health form is beneficial and hopefully they're honest with you. That's the biggest thing. So sometimes oh, cool. they just don't feel comfortable. Yeah. You know, sometimes they just don't feel comfortable about bringing up those, um, kind of issues. And yeah, uh, it does get to be that issue of of communication and making sure that you can say the right thing. But I think there's another aspect to, um, to having a person comfortable on your table. And that is if you truly are sincere in your communication, if you're sincerely talking to the person and offering and asking the right questions, more likely 
they're going to be more sincere with you. So there's a point where we actually get flippant in our standard communication, things that just kind of roll off the tongue. Um, the picture in the background is me um, <laughs> massaging at a spa that I owned years ago. Um, and it was, it, it was interesting because at this spa, we had a standard practice that we would always say. So we'd start with undress your level of comfort. And then we'd go into a full body ma massage includes head, neck, face, shoulders, chest, arms, legs, hips, feet, hands, legs, and back. Are you comfortable with all of those areas? And looking at your face, you stopped hearing after a full body massage includes And that didn't give our clients any ability to kind of really connect with um, really what we're asking. Because what, we're, what we were trying to ask is, are there any areas of your body that you want me to ignore or focus on? I will make sure to keep any of your private areas, including your chest and anything that's covered by underpants, covered. Are you comfortable with that? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, just avoid my, my ears. I don't like my ears rubbed. Done. I don't like rubbing ears either. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a great, there's a lot of good endings of, uh, uh, yeah, no, that, we'll move on. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and I had a um, past massage student. Um, he did a cool way of explaining with draping. What he did was he grabbed a pillowcase, and he showed on himself, the areas that will be covered all the time. Um, and so on the front side, what areas he's going to cover and how he's going to actually drape with that pillowcase, even though it's not the pillow. I mean, it's actually a full sheet, but oh. this something. For yeah. breast draping? Yeah, for, for breast health. draping. And, and then also for like the gluteal cleft regions to make sure the gluteal cleft isn't exposed. Um, so he shows how to um, drape the side of the glutes and everything else too. So Awesome. Yeah that, yeah, that is one of those pieces where you kind of go, okay, here's a safety mechanism. Here's a place where we want to make sure that your comfort and the demonstrate is huge. Um, if you can't show someone how you're going to do it, should you really be doing it? Yeah, because I, I like to use um, uh, medical terms as much as possible. So you don't want to say uh, the, other, the other term instead of gluteal cleft and stuff. So... And have you ever had to explain what that means? I, um, I did, um, but the thing is, I just had my hand go up and down, so no. I didn't. <laughs> but gluteal cleft. Yep, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you do. You, you kind of have to have that point of safe, that point of recognition of what is actually um, – what is actually being talked about and, and what you're presenting because I mean there have been times that I've shoot my, my business is named educated touch because I teach people while they're on my massage table I want to educate my clients about what muscles I'm touching and why and what muscles on them are tight and which ones are not um, hey Brenda Charles says hello hi Brenda um, so I mean you want to be able to educate them, but you want to be able to educate them at a point that they understand. And so talking about the gluteal cleft, um, I think that's an uh, ideal example where people might go, gluteal cleft, that's that, right? And you can say, yes, that, that is the crack that we want to make sure to avoid. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. But you're giving them an opportunity. So next time they hear gluteal cleft, they'll be like, know what that is. My friend Ryan yeah. told me that one. <laughs> I am so annoyed when I look at kids, kids, oh, kids, I feel like an old guy. Um, kids nowadays who, when they come out of high school and get into college, and they don't know anything about their body. They've got no clue about 
anatomical terms, biology. Um, they know they've got a skull thing uh, in their head that holds their brain, brainials. Um, and that's about it. They got this worm-like spine thing. And I, I just kind of go, oh, how can you be alive without at least some basic anatomical knowledge? There are a lot of people out there who just don't. And so being able to even educate them one word at a time so that they're feeling safe and understand, that's always important. So getting on back to the draping aspect of this, because I just wanted to really push this home and really make sure we're on it. Draping is a really important way for people to know their own comfort zones as well. Um, when you did that anterior thigh drape, um, one of the key things that I really am connected to is having a purpose for everything you're touching. That also then goes back to having a purpose for everything you're draping or undraping. So why are you working on that inner thigh if you don't know the muscles, the names of the muscles there? Because there are massage therapists who once learned the names of the muscles on the inner thigh, but couldn't figure out which one was which. And they think the pectineus is up here. <laughs> That's a massage joke. Yep. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah I, I'm gonna put that sound effect in um, later. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and you know what this is, right? Uh -oh. Peck pec minor posse. Okay. <laughs> the peck minor gang. Yeah, we, we have three, four, five. Oh, there we go. <laughs> The word to your mother. <laughs> exactly. Oh, I'm so pasty in a pink shirt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So making sure that as you're working with that client, you'll know when you get to an uncomfortable boundary. And if someone is squirming or someone is getting rigid, that's when you need to stop and ask for more clarification. Because if you're not willing to stop and ask for more clarification, you're probably doing something wrong. There's something that you're not seeing, not connecting with to keep that person safe. And that's the scary point for me. That's the point where I have to say, we really need to connect more with those, uh, those clients to make sure that they feel comfortable and make sure that they are able to, from beginning to end, know that it is their session and you're there to help them because if they yeah, have the, problem, the problem is if you um, wreck it for that client um, they're more likely never going to get a massage again um, never get a massage again or never get a massage from a male or female again whichever you are um, or never um, Never undress to that standard. Um, I have to tell this story because it's one of my favorites um, and it's about draping. I had a sweet old lady who uh, came to my office. Um, my office was actually at this point in a basement of a chiropractic office. And so it was a little bit of a dingy basement. It was clean, but it was cold and it was in Portland. So it was wet. The, the basement wasn't wet, but it was just kind of dank, kind of, kind of that, that moist. And she came down and I started talking to her and gave her the undress to your level of comfort. And she asked what that meant. I said, whatever you're comfortable wearing for me to work on your body, that will be absolutely fine. She says, oh, okay. So I walked out and she put on her coat and got under the sheet. So I came in and I pulled the sheet down and noticed that her coat was on. And I thought, that's her comfort level. That's what she wants. So I did a full one hour massage, back, hips, legs, feet, checked in with her constantly about where I was working on. And at the end of the session, she says, oh, that was really nice. I bet it would have been nicer if I didn't have my coat on. And I said, 
yeah, maybe next time we could try it without your coat. And she came back another time and she took off her coat and her, uh, I think her shirt and her, her pants. And she had her bra and her underpants and even her socks on. And I was like, perfect, if that's what you're comfortable in. But it was several sessions to get her to be comfortable. And it was all about her comfort. And for her, that was what she was comfortable wearing. And I was absolutely okay with it. And that's, I think, something that massage therapists need to get into their mind, that it's not our job to tell them that this could be a better session if you don't wear clothes. Because oh. that's not true. You can do a great session at any level of partial dress. And so making sure that they feel comfortable underneath the sheet is really, really kind of one of those key aspects to make sure that they're comfortable and they know that you're safe. Yeah, and, and I wanna bring up an example. Um, when I first had my business um, back in the day, um, I got a referral from the psychiatrist um, with this lady with um, a uh, anorexia. Okay. And, um, the psychiatrist thought it would be a really good idea for her to feel more comfortable with her body. So, I mean, the first few sessions, I mean, she wore all of her clothes. And eventually, I mean, she she took off her socks and took off her um, shirt um, and I massaged her. But it took quite a few. But I just, whatever she felt comfortable with, it just took a little while. That's awesome. Did, yeah. How long did you see her for? Do you remember? It was about 10 sessions, and then I started teaching, so. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Teaching yeah. always gets in the way of good yep. stuff. <laughs> Darn teachers. Yeah, um, I, I thought that was a really cool idea uh, with the psychiatrist to, to recommend that to uh, make them, because sometimes it's uh, body image with people with anorexia, so. I love that. that. That's, I would love to see research on that Massage Therapy Foundation. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. For you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Because there is a lot of challenge with self image that really could, I mean, we're not going to fix it as massage therapists, but we would allow them to really challenge their limitations for what their body image challenges are. I pretty awesome. Yeah. I like that story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So real quick, let's go back to uh, that one. Nope. Nope. Go stop here. Now we're gonna go and hit a couple of more buttons here. And I'm gonna take that off, take that off, and go here and go to the NCB. Remembering that we were on the National Certification Board of Therapy, Massage, and Body Workers website. Going on down, Code of Ethics number 12 provide draping and treatment in a way that ensures the safety, comfort, and privacy of the client. Remembering that it's not about you as the massage therapist. Yes, partially you have to be conscious of your comfort, your safety, but with draping, you're talking about safety, comfort, and privacy of the client because we want them to be aware and anxiously engaged so that they can actually want to return to see you. So. All right, Ryan, anything going on in your life that, uh, that the massage world needs to know about? Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, in May, I'm going to Denmark for World Championship of Massage. So, How, how do you get into the World Championship of Massage? Um, you just register, and then there's, like I think, five or six different um, categories. Um, and I... Uh, last year, I took a lot of pictures. Um, I'm taking pictures and videos again this year. So it's just so nice to meet people from all over the world. So last time, uh, last time there's over 30 different countries representing. And awesome. Yeah. And so w when they're when they're grading these, uh, when they're w do they call it grading when they're doing these competitions? Uh, how how do they determine a winner? So uh, what it is, they, they have usually um, five people judging for each category, and then um, everybody does a number system um, for their top pick, their second pick, third pick, and a number point for each. And then the top um, person from that uh, wins that category, and then they go on to the world championship um, portion, 
So then they compete against the other one. So yeah, <laughs> I, it's, it's honestly, it's, I, I think it's hard, but it's a, a cool concept and it gets massage known, especially over, um, um, over in Denmark region, and everywhere else. It's um, massage is a lot more popular over here. It's, it's, it doesn't seem as popular um, over in the Europe country. So, see, many years ago, I was um, when I was volunteering for the Oregon chapter of AMTA. Um, we had a party for the massage therapists in Portland, and uh, and we invited any massage therapist to come and and play and do stuff. And I did a thing called the massage therapy Olympics. Yeah, and and we had a couple of different games. Uh, nothing as massage focused as that but I would really like to either compete or at least watch because that sounds like a lot of fun but our, our games we had two we had intellectual tug of war and so we had uh, a whole line of chairs that uh, that people would sit in we'd have like teams of five and then they'd all hold on to a rope and then we'd ask this team a question and then that team a question and when one team got it right they'd move that direction and then when the other team get it right, they pulled it. So that was all massage therapy based questions. Uh, but the, the one that kind of reminds me of this was speed draping. Um, we took oh. uh, neon dots and we put four neon dots on one of the two partners of the team, two on the front, one on the symphysis pubis and one on the um, coccyx. And we would have them start on one side of the yard and they would run across the yard and they would jump onto the table. And then they had a, a judge who would call out different drapes to do. One was leg drape. One was uh, uh, turn them over, back drape. And then every time that judge saw one of the colors of the dots, you, you got added 10 seconds onto your score. And so they tallied up how many um, how many dots they would see, and that was the, the biggest problem. It was hysterical. It was so much fun to, to kind of, as massage therapists, see people running and just doing something that we all knew how to do and we all had done for some, and we would never do it this way in reality. However, it really kind of connected with, okay, so how tight is this drape? And, and can we make sure that we hold this? And how do we flip them over really quickly without them actually showing anything. It, it was a lot of fun, so awesome. Yeah, and sometimes you just gotta have fun, you know? <laughs> you know if you can't have fun in your profession, um, maybe you need a new profession. I, I, I want to love what I do for the rest of my life. And so if I'm a crazy old massage therapist at 80 and 90 years old, I'll be happy to be that crazy old massage therapist. <laughs> you're, you're just a couple years away. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you've ever gone to the AMTA National Convention, um, there are actually several massage therapists who have been doing it for 50 plus years that I don't know if they come every year, but they try and I've, I mean, I've seen them a lot um, at conferences. And you just get to know them and get to see them. And they're just so endearing because you look at them and you're like, okay, you've been doing it for 50 years. You started when you were 30, you're 80 years old now. How many massages do you still do? Oh, I do one or two a week. Awesome. I am so wanting to be that guy. <laughs> one or two massages a week and retired and just having fun. I love that idea. So... As long as yeah, once a therapist, always a therapist. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Even the people who leave the profession, they don't leave the profession. <laughs> I know you do it in your basements or in your front room. I, I know. Or or, or they keep their um, table in their garage, like somebody I know. It's yeah, it's outside. <laughs> You'll never leave the perfect. It, it, my uh, my wife and I early on we started laughing because um, the person who actually got me into massage therapy was one of my wife's friends who had just graduated from the massage school that I went to. And when I heard that she was doing massage therapy, I was like, "Wow, I didn't realize that was a career." 
<laughs> and she's like, yeah, it's a great school. And she talked to me, talked to me. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I totally want to do. And she's now no longer a licensed massage therapist. She's married to an uh, Air Force guy and outstanding uh, couple. I still love them. Don't get to talk to them nearly enough. But there's several times she'll give me a text or something. Hey, you know, my son hurt this and he was doing this. What could I work on to help him with that? <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're not retired from massage therapy. You're still in it. So yeah. <laughs> it's still the massage brain. And it's, uh, it's wonderful and endearing all in the same time. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Nathan. The hour has flown by. We hope you've enjoyed this discussion with ethics outside the box. As you've seen, Nathan uses many second-hand stories of ethical situations. If you'd like to share your story or you have any questions, feel free to contact him and Nathan at educatedtouch.com. If you'd like to register for next week's live webinar, go to shop.educatedtouch.com. Under live webinars, you will see all upcoming webinars. If you have just watched this video and would like continuing education for home study, you can go to shop.educatedtouch.com under the home study options with the date or episode number to receive your exam. If you would please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel, we will keep you up to date on new videos. If you'd like to attend one of our live courses, you can find upcoming scheduled events at www.educatedtouch.com. Thank you for joining us today. Be well and have an ethical day.